Try Jassa, to... we, we've done that annoying thing where we have basically chatted for uh, <laughs> like an hour before <laughs> hitting record <laughs> and we've lost probably lots of gold. Now, I'm sure I'm sure we're going to get to it. Um, Bola, why don't we start off with the the book? I've, I've been a fan of yours for years. I love your comedy. Um, your acting career has just, you know, gone from strength to strength. But this is a completely different side of you that I mm. loved diving into because there's a sort of seriousness, there's sort of like a historical aspect and uh, the academic side of you as well. I, th- I thought it was, <laughs> it was f- you know, phenomenal. Um, what, do, what do you really mean by both not half and, and how did this all come to fruition? So both not half really has been my way of understanding my mixed heritage identity, a way of sort of reconciling this feeling that I had within myself that I was somehow fractured and fractional and my journey to discovering and realizing the truth that I am whole and multiple. And it really was born out of, um, through my acting, you know, I wanted to, you know, I just go back to the beginning. Like when I started as an actor, the industry sort of taught me to be grateful for my whiteness because Mm. my whiteness was what was going to get me work. You know, I was able to get a foot on the ladder when my brown peers were sort of struggling. And, you know, I I managed to keep my name. I was sort of quite confident that, you know, just seemed to stick in people's mind. Um, And also, I think because of my appearance, just was not immediately identifiable um, as a South Asian or Punjabi name, yeah. um, often people would be like, ah, they, everybody would want to pronounce it as Yasa, yeah. thinking it was some sort of, I don't know, like a Scandinavian name. Yeah. I think Ikea did actually have like a, a, like really? a, a, a Yasa basket at one point. <laughs> yeah. um, so like it was this strange sort of ambiguity that was yeah. around it. Anyway, and you know, I was just like, I was desperate to be working, you know, when I started out as, as an actor and I had some success and... You know, I was played a, a telegraph boy, East London telegraph boy in Ripper Street, a, a Soviet spy in Peaky Blinders. Mm-hmm. And and those opportunities really came my way because I was able to play white. Yeah. Um, but then around early 2019, sort of late 2018, I was starting to feel like there was this shift that, that was being happening in the industry towards telling more representative stories on screen. Yeah. There was more and more conversations around diversity. And I just felt quite excluded from those conversations. And I guess in a way I'd excluded myself as well through, you know, wanting to kickstart my own career. And then suddenly realized, I was like, oh, there's huge, there's this huge part of myself, my, my Punjabiness, my Indianness. You know, my first love of performance came from Bhangra. Mm. And I saw the, the opening of the book is this story of me, me dancing at a wedding um, in India in February 1994. And just that was my first, you know, recorded performance. And, and I was like, oh, there's this huge part of me that I'm not getting to explore um, as part of my work. And actually it's a huge part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And it got to a point where I was like, I I need to do something with this. And so I am sort of inspired by folk like Guz Khan and Just Rain. And, um, I shot this very, very, very lo-fi video on my phone of me making some dal, um, you know, <laughs> nowhere near the sort of like production values of, uh, <laughs> of your kitchen. Um, but it was just me being like, but yeah, like an uncle G character being like, you know, oh, what are you making? And I was like, um, you know, I'm making some dal and this is all in Punjabi. And, um, and then I say that I was going to put these corn vegan pieces in it. And then my uncle sort of like lays into me yeah, about yeah. how, you know, this is your mum's fault. And like, <laughs> it was like, all just, <laughs> and it all just seemed, it was very fun and just lighthearted and, and I was like, you know what? I'll just throw that out there. See what happens. Anyway, posted it on Instagram. I wake up the next morning. It's like 10,000 views. It's like, you know, back then 10,000 views was like, that yeah. was like just beyond anything I'd ever experienced. Totally. Um, you know, it was popping up in like family WhatsApp groups in like Canada, Australia. Like it was, it was wild. And then in the comments, um, somebody had, um, when I was scrolling through, had tagged their mate and said, um, you know, this guy speaks better Punjabi than us and he's only half. And I saw the words only half. And, and in that moment, it was just sort of, I realized that, oh yeah, I'm not half. 
actually watching the video and seeing how people were responding, they were, you know, I wasn't just speaking Punjabi like with my voice. It was with my body, my mannerisms. I was sort of, I, I was fully Punjabi. Yeah. And I sort of realized that seeing that comment. And so I responded um, with this hashtag, both not half. And, and as I wrote it, as I then posted it, I was like, oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's quite good, that is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I, you know, I edited the post because I, initially I posted it and I just used the hashtag white Punjabi. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was just like a literal description. It didn't really explain what was going on. And there were lots of people who were like genuinely confused. They just, they couldn't comprehend how somebody who looked like me could speak Punjabi in yeah. the way that I was speaking it. But both not half sort of seemed to, to encapsulate this whole idea and it seemed to resonate beyond just people with mixed identity it was really just like anybody with any sort of mixed heritage and that's mm. why the you know the subtitle talks about mixed heritage not mm. mixed race because mm. i think this is a conversation that goes beyond ethnicity and race it's about all of us you know i say in my ted talk none of us are half anything all of us are both something and that just suddenly seemed to take off and then it was this bizarre thing of like, what do I do with this? And I was really trying to get my head around what do, what does both not half mean? I don't, this sort of seemed to come from somewhere and I articulated it and suddenly the world made sense in a way, but I couldn't quite make sense of the story yeah. um, and where I was at in my own journey. And so I spent that summer and I think, you know, just before we started recording, I was saying I had this sense of I could either become, start just making loads of videos for Instagram and become like an influencer type and, you know, chase views and likes and all of that. Yeah. But I just didn't feel, I just found that quite exhausting. I tried it a couple of times, but I was just like, I, I just doesn't feel like me. Mm. And I felt that there was something deeper going on. And so I spent the summer really, um, I wrote a personal essay for myself in which I tried to really get to the core of what does this mean? What is my story? What has led me to this point? And in doing that, I realized that both not half was this, it was like a new way of seeing the world. It was like this non-binary way of thinking of, of not thinking in fractions and parts and thinking in holes and multiples. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I felt like I'd really got a handle on what, what that was. And then out of the blue, I got this, a DM from the TEDx Jandigarh team to go and do, and I was, and they were like, oh, do you want to come and do a, um, I mean, it was quite an intimidating because the message was like, um, we think that you could um, create magic and inspire millions. Oh, and I was like, that's a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know about that, but I do have a essay which has not been published and is basically a prepackaged ready-made talk. And so I went and did that. And um, that was like January, 2020 came back then COVID hit mm. and then I had no idea if the TED talk would, was ever going to see the light of day because I think the files were on a hard drive somewhere in Chandigarh and their editor was in Mumbai and like anyway it was only in then August 2020 that it, it came out and then suddenly I was like oh wow this is the responses then made me realize that there was something bigger going I think I I knew like in the in the final con conclusion bit of the talk I sort of say that this sort of goes beyond you know what I'm talking about today it's mm. about it's about class gender sexuality um spirituality there's there's all these other elements to it but it was only after the TED talk came out that I then sat down and was like okay what does I guess I need to start figuring that bit out now the, mm. the what comes next and that was then the journey of the book of um yeah, what, what did happen? You know, once I sort of articulated both and a half, had this sense of like, I have a better sense now of who and what I am. Um, but then suddenly the world started to look different. And yeah, that that realization and that journey is what, what the journey of the book is. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And it, I feel like we need to rewind for anyone watching this on mm -hmm. YouTube because they're probably thinking to themselves, in a non-judgmental manner, why is this bloke who looks ostensibly white yeah. talking about Punjabi <laughs> and mixed heritage? So why do we address the element yeah, yeah. of the room of, um, of like your background and, and, yeah. and where you grew up and, and your family? Yeah, so I've got a white English mum, uh, brown Punjabi dad. Um, he was born in India, moved to the UK when he was about seven years old. 
Um, Three pants in the pocket, probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was always yeah my uh, my grandfather's. So, uh, it always seemed to like get less and less. Like it would start. I think initially it started at ten pounds, then it got to like the other three pounds thing, and then it was just like I had no money. Um, but um, yeah, they met in their um, early twenties um, in Coventry, and um, then and I was born in nineteen ninety and. I don't think anybody expected me to be as sort of white as I am. Um, and yeah, but I was just immersed in my Punjabi culture from, mm. from the outset. You know, my mum made a real effort actually to, um, you know, when my, when my dad sort of told his parents, you know, I've got a white girlfriend and, you know, we'd like to get married. Um, my mum went to visit um, my Punjabi grandparents and she, she'd painted, um, a painting of, um, her mother side of the mm-hmm. golden temple as like a, I guess as a peace offering. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, and she and had just this... for listeners who don't know what that is, it's, uh, uh yeah, the, the sort golden of the, temple, the golden temple, the sort of the main, um, sort of the primary, um, Sikh place of worship, um, in Amritsar, um, in India. And, um yeah and she and she had this grilling from my my grandfather about you know like how would you raise kids and all of that and and my mum was really insistent from the outset that you know that she was a she would want to raise us and this is the, her words at the time was you know 50 percent english 50 percent punjabi and that connecting us you know when i say us i mean me, me and my sister that um or any kids that they were going to have is yeah. that uh, that we would she would want us to be connected to our to our Sikh heritage, to our Punjabi, you know, to be immersed in the language, to spec- go to India. Um, and and so that's what happened. You know, like my mum learned enough Punjabi to be able to, you know, discipline me. <laughs> like we would use words like um, she would be like, oh, um, do you want a glass of Barney? Yeah. Like just mixing yeah. language in here and there. So and this was the. I guess the reason why my, you know, I talk about in the book, like my my sense of my identity crisis came quite late in my life yeah. was because I was immersed in this total mixed, dual um, sort of whole environment from such an early age that it wasn't, there was nothing incongruous about it. I was also growing up in the Midlands, you know, I, yeah. I spent, I was born in Coventry, but um, because of like issues with, getting into school at a certain time of the year, I ended up um, starting school in in Leicester and living with my Punjabi grandparents in Leicester, so which is like just a totally mixed heritage city. Yeah, yeah. You know, half the city shuts down for Diwali. Yeah. Like, you know, like, so, so to my mind, there was nothing strange or particularly special about, you know, who and what I was. Um, you know, my granddad was also a, a, a teacher at the my primary school. So, you know, I had my turban wearing grandfather roaming the corridors of my primary school. Yeah. So even at school, there was, you know, I was sort of like this mini celebrity. I was Mr. Wally's grandson and mm. people knew who I was. Um, and I always thought that was sort of why I've always been quite comfortable with any degree of recognition and fame that comes with acting. But mm. when I was writing the book, I also realized that that's, probably why I always felt quite at ease in my identity because I never had to explain myself in a school context, you know, primary school years, such a formative time. My Punjabiness was just known and accepted as just, you know, part of the fabric of the school. Mm. And yeah. And even then when like, I, I remember having, when I started secondary school and, you know, like a sleepover sat around the kitchen table or something, just chatting into the night explaining to somebody that I'd had this multi um generational extended family upbringing and they were like oh that's kind of different mm-hmm. like how strange that you didn't actually live with your parents during school times and I was like oh yeah that is I guess different um but again it wasn't like a feeling of othered being othered and and I and I came to reflect and when I was writing, I was like, I think it was sort of I was insulated by my whiteness again because I wasn't like some sort of like, um, I don't know, quote unquote, like foreign other. I was just like I, I was like a just a white dude with an interesting backstory. <laughs> um, so it just became like it, it was fine. It wasn't an issue. 
it was only then really in my um, early 20s when I was sort of interacting, sort of moved away from Leicester, came down to London, was interacting with the world. And it just seemed to be so much of life seems to be predicated on being like, are you this or are you that? Mm -hmm. Like boundaries, division, um, borders. And and then I was like, oh, right. I'm not quite sure where where this sits now because like, you know, like with, like I was saying with my acting, I was having to present myself as one particular thing, which was like, I'm a, I'm a white dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the, and I guess in acting, you know, if uh, particularly from my limited understanding of auditions, mm. they want to know like w what, what you are, you know, what, yeah. how you appear, you know, what you could, what role you could play, I guess. So I guess those, those definitions, those boundaries are probably a bit higher than in av another sort of Yeah, application. yeah. Yeah, so much of acting is predicated on appearance. Just a quick one. If you're enjoying this kind of content, you will love our free newsletter called Eat, Listen, Read. Every week I send you a recipe that you'll absolutely love, something to listen to, something to read, sometimes something to watch, less than three minutes, and it will help you have a healthful, happier week. You can find that in the link down below. But off, yeah, but and it, but it's what gatekeepers perceive you to be. Uh -huh. So a lot of the work I've done with my um, union equity through the race equality committee, which I stood for election to, that was all part of my journey to standing fully in my mixed identity was mm. to be like, okay, I can I can engage with the issues of race in a in a in a meaningful way, and I wanted to sort of change. Um, basically because of that, I wanted to change what, how we think about mixed heritage appearance on screen, on film and TV, because that's sort of how we understand ourselves. And um, yeah, like the, the, the main, the UK casting database spotlights for a long time, or basically since uh, as long as I'd been on it up until a few years ago, about a year ago, had appearance as like a category. Mm. And that just seemed... I initially I just sort of accepted it. I was like, well, yeah, well, I guess that's how the industry works. You got to list your appearance. And I think I had like white, I did have mixed race on there, but I soon learned that mixed race was not what this is. Um, and um, I think I, I had like either like Mediterranean or um, I think Eastern European because I'd done Russian at uni and I could like, I played a Russian spy and um, yeah. Peaky Blinders. Um, so yeah, it was like, oh, appearance. And then it occurred to me as we were doing this work around like what does mixed look like on screens that why am I listing my appearance when there's my photo there? Like my photo is my appearance. Yeah. Why am I having to um, sort of like, why am I prioritizing a casting director or a producer's assumption of what I look like? Um, and actually, so, so part of our, campaign i'd sort of put a motion together for our annual union conference a couple of years ago and saying look we just need to change this it should be as you say like this is what i am um and just present your you know your your heritage mm. and so we introduced through like a year of consultation um there's this new category that got introduced on spotlight the casting system which is just ethnicity and heritage. And it allows for, and this is a point that I made in those meetings is that it needs to allow for true multiplicity um, and not a, like a hierarchy of like, well, I'm, you know, in number one, I'm white. In number two, I'm mixed. In number three, I'm, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so now the system allows me to list myself as white, South Asian, mixed, um, Sikh, Punjabi, English, British, and they all, you know, they're just listed alphabetically. Uh -huh. And so now in search results, and this is the point I was trying to make to them, I was like, you know, if the tools aren't there in order to properly reflect what a diverse, our diverse society looks like, then the stories we tell aren't really being reflective um, of the society we live in. And that sort of has there's this feedback loop. So if the tools are there, you know, it's not going to change how people start casting overnight. Mm. Um, but at least the tools are there now. So like if somebody's casting a show and they're like, OK, you know, we're casting a South Asian family um, and they, you know, they put in a search for, you know, actors, South Asians, I don't know, age between whatever. And 
um, and they need to be able to speak Punjabi. So we put that in and then my face pops up. Now they're not necessarily going to be like, oh yeah, great. They're probably going to be like, why is that white dude come up mm. in these search results? Mm. But it might prompt that conversation. Yeah. And it's like, when we're telling those stories, you know, what is it, what is important? Have you thought about the fact, could this be a mixed family? Is it important that the character is visibly brown? Because maybe that is important to the story or maybe it isn't. Maybe what's important is that this character speaks fluent Punjabi or um, grew up in a, understands um, Sikh Punjabi cultural practices um, or, or there's another sort of specificity to it. Yeah. And actually maybe I am right for that then. And there've been some casting directors who've been great. I've been seen for a couple of parts recently um, where casting directors have been sort of encouraging that sort of thinking mm. with producers and it's been really exciting. Um, but it's very early days. And but what's interesting is that when you look at the history of mixed identity and I look at like the Anglo-Indian community in India, it was well understood at the time that this is what, you know, mixed could look like in the same way that mixed could also look like you. Yeah, um, that's what I found so fascinating, I think, in the body of the book, because you dive into the history of uh, mixed race or mixed uh, identities. Uh, and it seemed like it was just more accepted, particularly in that era, which mm. is weird because we now think that we live in a sort of more progressive society where we can understand that you can be Punjabi, you can be Sikh. Yeah. Uh, and, and and all the other sort of uh, um, uh, people of, of mixed heritage as well. Mm. But it seems like we've we're sort of lost the sort of recognition in, in, the, in how divisive it seems that we've we've become over the last couple of years. Yeah, I, I guess, so that it's almost like, um, well, initially when the the um, the Brits, the, the English turned up in India, like mixed marriages were actively encouraged. Mm. Like payments were made for people to, you know, um, as they called it at the time, you know, like marry native women. Um, so it was actively encouraged. Um, and so you had lots of... Um, yeah, mixed families. And then, um, so yeah, there was a whole mixed population. So like, you know, I, I find it really interesting that you know, the first British uh, census of like British, the first census of all of British India in 1871 had a whole category, a whole table um, listing um, mixed races um, in there. And mixed race as a, as a census category was only introduced in, in the UK in 2001. Oh gosh. So it's like, wow. So that's how far back that history goes, the understanding. Uh, but then obviously you, the, the mixed population got really, um, uh, sort of marginalized and legislated against in the wake of basically in the wake of the American, um, declaration of independence. Mm. Um, there was this fear that a that a native population with ties to the land would rise up against um, the colonial power mm. and sort of declare independence in the way that they had it in the U.S. And so, the you know as there were the Anglo-Indian or Eurasian community in India at the time was sort of seen as as a, as a threat mm. that needed to be because um, up until that point, like um, Anglo-Indians, so mixed British Indians were were sort of. Um, had very influential positions within like the the civil service military there was almost preferent there was preferential, preferential treatment, treatment. Yeah. um and then it sort of went the other way mm. um and it was marginalized and so then so this all happens within the emergence of like race science and like sort of codified racism um and that's and i guess that's probably what leads to we live with the legacy of that that scientific racism um today and that's where notions of halfness mm. come from is and i find it interesting you know i say that we now know that you know half caste is a slur that we would not use in order to describe someone like me mm -hmm. but we, but while we've stopped using the caste bit you know coming from castus the latin word for pure like we know not to think in terms of purity but we do still think in terms of fractionality yeah, yeah. and and what's really to, to me it's like you can only be you can only be half of something if somebody else is somehow more whole mm. or you can only really be really you can only be mixed in a way if if somebody's pure <laughs> you know that's um 
so you know that there's sort of the limits of language as well I, uh, and that's why i really try to talk, talk in terms of like mixed heritage as opposed to race because i sort of strongly believe that there's, there's one human race and we all have a diversity of um heritages and that's what i always keep coming back to is that yes this is a the story of this book is coming from my experience of it as a mixed English Punjabi, but yeah. it's really the story of anyone just trying to find out, figure out who they are in a world that sort of seems to want to put people in boxes. Yeah, absolutely. And it, just to go back on the sort of um, encouragement of mixed uh, marriages and in, 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 in children in the sort of colonial areas, what were the intentions behind that? Because it feels like there there was probably something, there was some malice behind those like payments. Why would you pay uh, to 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 have a a, a child with a a, a native um, person? Yeah, I, I guess it was you know there was um, what they were wanting to do was like have an established population, um, and I guess within um in like you know in a in a respectable way so if you to have people marrying mm. um was was better than you know um i guess like brothels prostitution that mm. that sort of stuff um so yeah i mean i it might be more interesting if i just read that section because yeah, it's yeah, really yeah yeah no, go for it go for it because um, i found the history super fascinating uh, around um that sort of area. And I think, you know, after chatting with people like Satnam, for example, and other people who tell mm. the history of empire in a different light, one that sort of is honest to the brutality and the ill intention behind it. Mm -hmm. Sort of, I, I, I ha have sort of like a, I, I'm always sort of playing devil's advocate in my mind of like, okay, what was the sort of true uh, effort? Why was there so much sort of emphasis being given to, mixed marriages and stuff um, yeah 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 population um let me just find that uh, and perhaps that sort of like s has stemmed distrust of people from mixed heritages that we still live with today that was the quote so yeah on the 8th of april 1687 the east india company's directors issued another dispatch the marriage of our soldiers to the native women of Fort St. George, formerly recommended by you, is a matter of such consequence to posterity that we shall be content to encourage it with some expense and have been thinking for the future to appoint a gold pagoda to be paid to the mother of any child that shall hereafter be born of any such future marriage on the day the child is christened. Wow. So it was also about like the, the there was the religious element of it of you know it's about the, the christening of the Christian, child yeah, as well yeah. um it's funny they, they talk about it as being i say they talk about this as being um they call this dutch politics um because they say you know you know um the east india company issued a directive imploring its officials in madras to provide for such soldiers as are single men by prudently inducing them to marry gentus in imitation of the dutch politics and raise from them a stock of Protestant mestizos, but in actuality, it would have been more accurate to have called it Portuguese politics because right. they were the ones who sort of pioneered that yeah. sort of way of sort of establishing a colonial population. Mm. But because you know they were Catholic, that wasn't like yeah. that wasn't something they wanted to encourage in yeah. in in name. Um, yeah. Should I pop that back? Right. Oh yeah, you'll put it over there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Is that all right? For you? Um, yeah. So it was you know it was about just creating a, a population. It's not like you could just sort of ship people back and forth from like the you needed to have like uh, families as established mm. um but you know it was you know it was that's why you know when anglo-indian became defined in the indian constitution um it's very much and this was also blew my mind like the fact that anglo-indian is defined yeah in the indian constitution alongside such broad terms as like tax and debts and stuff like that yeah. is the anglo-indian but it's all very about it's about the paternal line it's yeah. about having a basically a, a european father grandfather great grandfather because that was how most of those mixed marriages yeah. or pretty much all of those mixed marriages was about yeah you know white european men marrying um south asian women mm -hmm. and sort of establishing mixed families um so yeah it was part of the the colonial project and then but then when you get ideas of like racial purity and mm. scientific racism emerging throughout the 1800s 
um that's when like mixed kids sort of become the battleground of mm. like where you know you, i talk about sita balani's book deadly and slick and she talks about you know how mixed kids was um where where the work of upholding um racial chastity or racial purity became visible um and that's where like you know are you white and can you pass as as white and um, and you get this in in Hollywood, and I talk about like the early days of Hollywood. You know, Merle Oberon um, was an Anglo Indian um, who was the first um, first woman of South Asian um, heritage to be nominated for an Oscar. Yeah. Um, but nobody knew that that was the case at the time because yeah. you know she passed and insisted that she was white, um, even though she had a, her mum. Um, charlotte um who was with her the whole time but was just passed off as like her her indian servant and it's, it's like really sad yeah. tragic stuff and discovering this history sort of made me feel it was very sad but at the same time it it, it was quite joyous as well because i suddenly felt like oh i i feel connected to a history i feel part of a legacy that i'm i'm not so much of the feeling that led to both not half was feeling alone um and actually discovering that even in my own field in like you know film and tv that, that i was sort of part of a um uh, basically discovering that i wasn't the first person the mi yeah. first sort of mixed indian english actor to sort of come up against this um thing of trying to figure out like who am i am i going to play this character am i going to yeah. play this am i going to play that that actually there was a history there yeah yeah um and actually and this is i think this is really the important thing is that people like merle oberon passed as white you had somebody like anna kashvi who was of anglo-indian heritage but because of her appearance insisted that she was indian um and when i spoke to the historian uther charlton stevens he sort of really pointed out this so the interesting thing is that even though um, it was easier to pass as white, in Anna Kashvi's case, she couldn't, so she insisted on her Indianness. In neither case did anybody assert their mixedness, and actually, it's mixedness—the idea of disrupting mm. um, racial hierarchy, separation, this sort of binary. Like you're either you either you're either white or you're brown. You're either white or you're not white. Mm. And that's sort of why with the work that I'm doing now, I'm sort of trying to say, actually, I want to put mixed people as mixed people on screen. I want to tell mixed stories um, because I think that's that sense of, that's really important. You know, I think of somebody like Ben Kingsley, who's sort of known yeah. for being this sort of chameleon-like performer who can play anything and everyone and, he for a long time was like my only example of like somebody of mixed heritage or, uh, as an actor. Um, but none of his most famous roles are, are mixed people. You know, you think of Ben Kingsley, yes. you think of, you know, like Gandhi. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? That we don't have, it's not sort of commonly understood that, you know, what I was saying before, that this is what mix can look like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what mix can look like, yeah, you know. Yeah. Not that you are, yeah. me, but I'm just saying yeah, that yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. entirely possible. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I want to, I want to go back to the vernacular around um, mixed and half and fifty percent mm. this and stuff because I think to I agree that these conversations are super important as we, you know, we live in a uh, thankfully in a, in a really sort of progressive society where we're having lots of different people from background from different backgrounds mm. um uh marrying and, and having relationships i'm personally in a marriage where my wife is uh what would would be classed as white she's italian on both sides she grew up in australia yeah um and so i think it's pertinent to sort of like figure out the right way of talking about this in a sort of uh, non-judgmental manner mm. on the other side i think to play devil's advocate there will be some people who perhaps haven't had sort of a uh, primary experience of what mm. you're talking about who might push back and just be like well you know what i mean i'm not saying 50 percent out of malice i'm not yeah, saying yeah, you're yeah. half out of malice 
Sure. I just want to sort of navigate this confusing world for me and things that I don't really understand mm. in a way where I'm not treading on other people's toes. And I feel like I'm always getting things wrong. Mm -hmm. And if you do get things wrong, then you're sort of chastised for it. And I think that can sort of breed antagonism. Yeah, yeah. Um, to the whole idea, to the mm -hmm. point where you go down the extreme way. It was like, well, English should be white anyway. This right, is a white yeah. country, <laughs> you know? I, I can see the sort of thought pattern. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you can either shy away from it and call those people bigots, or mm -hmm. you can actually embrace their viewpoint and from a, from a, a, a place of... Um, non-judgment and patience which mm -hmm. is very hard to do mm -hmm. it's very hard to do so i wonder how you navigate those conversations which, which i'm sure you have not just yeah in person but also online right yeah like um i think it's fine to make mistakes um i don't think i don't think there's an issue with that like i don't you know i it's not like if i hear somebody describe me as half punjabi i'm like you know um I don't know, <laughs> being like, you're cancelled. <laughs> like, like it's, it's not, it's not that. Like, it's um I guess what language is, it's a means of trying to articulate very complex ideas and thoughts in a very simple, easy to understand mm. way. And the yeah, the the words we use are a reflection of our our thinking. Yeah. And so, so for me, when I say both, not half, it's about challenging the idea that I am, you know, half is something that is, that is lesser, is incomplete, um, it's diminished. Mm. Um, whereas both is, like I said before, you know, it's something that is multiple, is whole. Um, so when I'm challenging use of language i'm sort of being like it's not just it's not just about the words that we're using yeah it's about what are the what's the sort of the the actual the thoughts and the ideas that that influence those mm. word choices um and it can it can be challenging to change how we think when we've sort of grown up and inherited such fixed ideas mm. and those ideas are, are really just they're like narratives they're ways of thinking and it's entirely possible to change ways of thinking and i talk about you know i went on my own journey with this in i'd have a chapter on like gender and sexuality and um the conversation around like trans and non-binary identities and i really started to recognize the, the parallels in my experience mm. and trans and non-binary experience and the way in which the way i understand my, and know myself um is not necessarily the way that society reads me and the way I understand myself is sort of incongruent with the way in which society reads me. And through that, I came to really understand um, the conversation around trans liberation, queer liberation, non-binary gender identities. And, and that was my own learning. You know, I say quite openly in the book, when I first came across the phrase, trans women are women, I struggled to understand what it meant. And then I applied the lens of both, not half. Mm. And I was like, well, I guess in the same way that, you know, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like white Punjabi is Punjabi. It's like, yeah, like to, I'm, um, it doesn't make me any less um, Punjabi. Um, there's not like a, a hierarchy of Punjabiness. Um, I'm equally valid in my experience of my Punjabiness in much the same way that a trans woman is equally valid in their experience of womanhood and but that was a i had to learn and i made mistakes you know I've got trans non-binary friends and family and there was you know my sister had just um was in a relationship with somebody um who's non-binary and it took me a while to get used to pronouns and and stuff like that i made mistakes but i you know apologized corrected myself moved on i learned and i and it i was able to you know, expand my thinking. And that's, you know, really the second half of the book is how both not half helped me to better understand the complexity and nuances of the world. Yeah, And I think that's sometimes sadly what the challenge is or the, the what sort of leads to that bigotry and the narrow mindedness is sort of a refusal to engage in nuance and complexity because the world is 
can be difficult and complex and it's it can be hard to understand and we, we want to simplify um for our own like a sanity basically yeah. Yeah, yeah um but but it's almost like a refusal to think when you when you when you want to um yeah i think i say at one point in the book like you know like um like binary thinking in many ways is a, is a refusal to think because you're you're being like, no, I need a simple story yeah. and that's the only way I'm going to understand it. And I don't want to have to, you know, challenge the ideas that I've been taught growing up, the, my sort of preconceived notions of like how the world is. Yeah. Um, because actually that's quite scary. And I often feel that people f seem to feel like they're under attack in some way. And it's it's not, they're, they're not, n nobody's attacking anyone. Um, but I think what these conversations and these prompts do do is that they, they, ref they force you to reflect on yourself. And actually, I think that that is quite scary, um, to sort of confront yourself. Mm. This whole book is me confronting myself basically. And it was, it was difficult and it's challenging. And, um, you know, as I'm sure you got towards the end of the book, you sort of realize like quite how challenging and difficult that, yeah. that had been, um, yeah, that's the, so for me, yeah, I, I hope that, you know, um, in sort of prompting people to reflect on language and all of that, it's not a, um, yeah, I'm not looking to cancel anyone. I'm just, like, <laughs> just like maybe, but, yeah, it's possible to change how you think. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, that there's so many parallels there because I think I've also struggled a few years ago to understand the journey for people of, uh, different sexualities and and the the need to express themselves or the need mm. for pronouns for example and i think just to put it the the shoe on the other foot so to speak this isn't just a, a an issue with with people uh, of um sort of uh, european ancestry or you know white people it, it exists on both sides mm. yeah, yeah. yeah you know i i think we're all sort of guilty of wanting to simplify things and you're a Sikh, you marry another Sikh, or you're, you're right, Brian, yeah. you, you marry someone from India. And, you know, I, I think the the sort of um, the prejudices uh, are, are on both sides mm. uh, in a lot of ways. And um, and the, I guess the reason why I'm really interested in, in your experience is, um, so my, my wife and I are expecting our first child. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. She's, um, you know... It, it's uh the due date is like later on this year and and he's obviously gonna be of mixed heritage mm. you know and uh i think i remember having conversations with my wife and saying yeah he's gonna be 50 percent c punjabi and 50 percent italian australian isn't that right. amazing yeah you yeah. know and it wasn't said from a, a, a sense of malice obviously as you can yeah, tell yeah. um but in having and reading your book and listening to your story i want to ensure that this child never feels less than whole. Mm. Yeah, I'm sort of getting emotional as I'm talking mm, about it, but like, yeah. um, I I never, I don't want them to feel like they don't have a place. Yeah, yeah. And that has actually been some of my experience, you know, as as someone who grew up as um, Sikh Punjabi with um, parents on both sides who were Sikh Punjabi, I've always felt very disconnected to my um, origins because... I don't speak Punjabi. Mm. I don't speak uh, an Asian language. And I think there is a depth of um, connection that I've always lacked um, from childhood because I was never able to truly sort of understand what was going on at the Gurdwara. Yeah, yeah. What the Gyanis were talking about, what the sort of um, the uh, the Kirtan was actually saying and how to get to a higher power. I, my experience was basically how you described it in in the latter part of your book of you go there, you, you sort of like have this uh, crowded sort of um, chaos in sort of the reception and this calm as you go into the temple and the familiar mm. smells of uh, the prashad as it comes out and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like it evokes so much memory. I have somewhat of a connection, but it's always felt very superficial. Mm. And so just going back to my my point, I, I don't... I would say that was also, sorry, just yeah, briefly interrupt, yeah. is that that was also my experience of mm. the Gurdwara and, and Sikhi as a, as a kid. Um, so... But it's only been in my in more recently as I've been deepening my understanding that I've sort of found a, a deeper connection. And I think I don't want to distract too much from no, the no, point no, you're no, making, no. but that, that I think there's 
it's possible as well. Like I, th I think we often think of like, well, if we haven't, if we didn't learn this stuff as when we were really young, if we weren't immersed in it, you know, in a way from, from childhood, it's somehow lost. Mm. Um, my experience with, with this book and my own journey is that it's not lost. It, it can always be found and accessed and built upon. Mm. Um, and this, I think we often, we, we have this sense of like, we get caught up in our nostalgia for our lost childhood and actually, it, which blinds us to the fact that it's possible to sort of consciously gain wisdom as we grow older. And for me, this expressed itself in, you know, I felt in around 2014 that I was somehow losing my Punjabi that mm. because my grandparents were, they weren't gonna be around forever and that I wasn't speaking Punjabi on a daily basis with my grandparents that, you know, there would come a point where I, I would start to, I, was, I felt I was losing my fluency. Mm. Um, and then I was like, oh, and then I, found a way to like learn Gurmukhi, start using dictionaries, found these other ways of engaging with the language. And so was able to then imagine a future in which my Punjabi and my connection to culture got got stronger and deeper. Um, and I think it's really, it's, it's a case of, you know, resources, like having resources available to be able to learn, you know, you can learn Klingon and High Valerian on Duolingo, but you can't learn Punjabi. Yeah. That's, that's, that's probably why people find, get, upset that, they, that they're they not able to speak Punjabi is that the, the resources aren't there. Similarly with like understanding what's going on at the Gurdwara, like so much of like Sikhi has been taught and shared through the medium of Punjabi and actually the work of people like Satpal Singh, Nanak Nam and stuff that are, that are sharing this in English. That's how I've come to it. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think, yeah, sorry to interrupt. It was just that I, I'd really like to challenge this idea that that, that somehow if if it wasn't learned in childhood, it's yeah. it's lost. I, I don't think yeah that is the case. Um, yeah, it's entirely possible to to, to learn as we, as we grow older and, and get a deeper, more conscious understanding as well. Absolutely, yeah. And I yeah. feel like I want to come back to this point you make in the book around uh, Sikh heritage and how you described yourself as mm. uh, religious or or Sikh, or, um, but my my initial sort of train of thought if i can remember back to it yeah. was um words matter right mm -hmm. um and both not half just encompasses so much in just three words and i think people can read this book and understand uh their sexuality better their heritage better their religion better better their environment other people's experiences better mm. i think it's a way of really connecting and from a selfish point of view from my point of view i want to ensure that um, the way in which I address my unborn child mm. and uh, the extended family that they're going to be born into is is welcoming, and they don't feel like I might have done, you know, early right. in yeah, childhood. Yeah, yeah. You know, mm. um, I definitely feel a, a deeper sense of connection, but that's through reading and having yeah, great yeah. conversations. Like this one is going to go down in the mm. Hall of Fame for me. Um, but I, I wonder if you sort of have any any thoughts on on like how we can sort of be better addressing our children and becoming and, and creating a more uh, welcoming environment for them, and so yeah. they don't feel that sort of like the halfness. They don't feel yeah, the less yeah. wholeness that you describe so eloquently in the book. I, I think there's a couple of things. I think yeah. So firstly, I think the language of very simply the language of describing ourselves or our children as as both is actually quite big mm -hmm. like I, I've, I've had lots of messages from from parents um who have said like just that that little change in language has had a huge impact mm -hmm. on the way in which they've um been communicating with their kids and how their kids are then seeing themselves and actually for, for a child it's a, it's very easy because they believe they're half because they're told they're half. You tell them they're both, they're like, oh, I'm both. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and so they've, I've had like DMs from people who've been like, yeah, like um, my, you know, my child was sort of struggling with this in school. And then like, I saw your thing. And then I was like, oh yeah, you're both not half. And then, and then my like four or five year old was like, waltz into school the next day. And I was like, I'm both. And it's like, it's great. <laughs> and I'm like, that's wonderful. It can be as simple as that. Um, I think more widely though, I think it's not necessarily about just creating welcoming 
sort of safe environments in in our families because that's that was my experience mm. i had i had a both upbringing yeah. you know um that's what i talk about in the book is that actually i think both not half came from the fact that i did i've always felt both mm. even though i use even when i was at school like age 16 I actually sort of embraced half cast for a while as an mm. idea. I liked that there was a special word for me, mm. but because I wasn't aware of what it meant in a sort of a wider historical, social, political context, um, it was only then, yeah, because, you know, like I said, I was in Leicester, there was like yeah. Diwali celebration, yeah. all that. It was like, it didn't really matter to me. I didn't feel diminished. Um, I think widely, and this is sort of like, I guess, the sort of the, the sort of the political, the, you know, this book is described as part memoir, part manifesto. The manifesto element of this is be like, this should be everyone's experience. We should be creating a world in which everybody feels whole, um, whether that's because of your gender and sexuality, your your class, your religious background, um, your sense of national identity, um, your sense of citizenship and your ties to the country that you call home. It's about fostering a whole society which is like deeply empathetic, welcoming, defined by diversity. Um, so I think it's it's quite a big, I mean that sounds quite daunting. <laughs> it is daunting, but I mean it is it is a it is a is a challenge that you you can't just create that welcoming, wonderful environment at home. Um, it's got to be part of a wider societal sort of project of like reshaping how we think about what what is belonging, what is community. Um, because if we just think about community being about like a community is only people who look and sound like me then that's that's not really going to create that world that we want which is where we do feel whole and multiple and like like we do belong um so yeah i think yeah no, i don't know if that really uh, is the okay. the answer you're looking for but yeah. like i think you can create that at home for sure but i think understanding that okay i think it's like it's this thing of solidarity and this is what i've really learned through my trade unionism and my other activism is that the reason I turn up to, you know, um, like um, the uh, like there was a counter protest that I went to the like the the, the far right was sort of um, um, targeting a, a drag story story time was it like drag story hour um, event. The reason I'm turning up to those things is because I recognise is that my fight is your fight and your fight is my fight. That the world in which um a trans person feels safe and welcome is a world in which a mixed person feels mm. safe and welcome it's the world in which you know um somebody who's just arrived um from india um or from syria it, that that is the world in which they will also be made to feel welcome that all these struggles are are aligned and are actually the same and i think really understanding that on a deep level um is is what's needed to sort of create um you know i think it's like i guess it sort of speaks to your work as well like as uh with the work that you're doing with the doctor's kitchen is that you recognize that health is about more than you know turning up sick to the doctor and getting an injection yeah. so you've got to create a world in which you can be healthy yeah and you know you're tackling it through food but also it's, it's it's through food, but it's like access to food. That is a that is a issue of class and economics and, and the sort of the political world we live in is mm. that, you know, if we've got so many people relying on food banks um, and you can't, don't have access to, you know, fresh fruit and veg, and that's putting a strain on healthcare, like health outcomes, life expectancy, it's all connected. Mm. Um, so it has to be tackled at a sort of societal level as well as creating those environments at home as well for our yeah. kids to feel like, yeah, we are absolutely full and whole. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's just so many parallels there as well. And that's why I personally have a bias toward food because yeah. food isn't just about cow salads and like, you know, improving yeah, health. Yeah. It's it's the reason why we have conversations with folks like the Alexander Rose uh, charity who are giving food vouchers for people to exchange in market towns so people who are in the in the uh in in relative poverty can actually eat fruit and vegetables and that's having a remarkable effect and then yeah. it allows me to have a conversation with a good friend of yours satnam sangera about mm. how food influenced geopolitics over the last few centuries and beyond yeah. and you know and also about the nutritional medicine science and all that kind of stuff but also culture you know we're going to chat to malika basu 
uh, in a couple of hours. Um, you should stick around for that if you're yeah. if you're hungry. By the way, because mm. she's gonna be cooking for us. Amazing. Uh, but you know, she talks about preparation and uh, the 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 beauty of fusion, as well mm. as the sort of need to respect heritage. You know, um, uh, in 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 cooking, um, and this you know. This is why I, I, I love having these conversations because it, not to sort of uh, pigeonhole our audience, but our audience are uh, probably going to be on the sort of older side that mm -hmm. tend to be a bit more right leaning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is a nice way to sort of open up the conversation for people who might not otherwise tune in to, you know, or read the book or, you know, tune into a different podcast. Uh, food's just a really good connector of that. Mm. Um, and on the subject of oneness, um, mm. I, I wanted to talk about this sort of the ending chapters of the book where you go on this amazing trip and you, you have like this life threatening <laughs> experience. <laughs> almost die. Yeah, <laughs> almost died. And it's sort of, you know, w the way you describe like how you used to answer, you know, wh what is your religion or what is your background? And you were like, you know, I, I, I describe myself in a very similar way. I say I was raised a Sikh. Right, yeah. But I don't, I don't, call myself a Sikh, you know, don't wear a, a cutter or turban or mm. anything like that. Uh, my my parents are, are, are very Sikh and, and a, a lot of my extended family is as well. But I've always felt the sort of like um, uh, the chasm, you know, there's there's a bit of distance for me, right, yeah, like yeah. truly identifying it. But when you dive into the scriptures, a lot of it, uh, mm. you know, it just resonates. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, listen, I read the Stoics, I you know, yeah. Jad Jadli Kalar and all that stuff. It just all makes a lot more sense you know yeah um yeah i wonder if you could talk a bit about oneness because i guess that is the antidote to a lot of yeah issues that you've i mean yeah, everything i just sort of described yeah like recognizing the self in the other that is the the essence of oneness of ik wankar like the the all-pervading oneness that guru nanak talks about and i think for a long time yeah i grew up and Guru Nanak being sorry the um the first guru or the yeah, sort of founder the, of sikhism if you like yeah yeah, um, and for a long time, I had a very similar um, relationship with my my Sikh heritage to you. Like I would, I was like raised in a Sikh environment. I've always known how to conduct myself in a Gurdwara. Like I've never felt that's always felt like the the religious setting in which I feel I guess that I identified the most. But it was more cultural, mm -hmm. I think, beyond some very broad principles of you know, um, um, like community and charity and self selfless service and, and that sort of stuff, uh, equality. Um, but then, yeah, it was, what was it? It was like, yeah, I had this experience in, so I'm just trying to like, just piece together the, the story, mm. story like, cause actually the, the story of both not half and the story of my relationship with my my Sikh identity is actually quite, were quite connected in a way that I didn't realize until I wrote the book. Yeah. And then I realized that actually the, um, uh, what was it? The, the month before I articulated both not half, um, I'd had a conversation with a friend and I'd just come across these lectures, um, by Satpal Singh mm. on the, um, the meaning and, the, um, yeah, sort of like these in-depth translations, lectures on the meaning of Japji Sahib, which is the opening composition, or Mool Mantar and Japji Sahib, the opening composition of um, the Guru Granth Sahib. And I was like, none of this seems to be um, religious in the way um, that I expected. I'm just going to backtrack a little bit, because actually what, so what happened was, oh yeah, so... I was just on Twitter and a video popped up of a very traditional Sikh looking guy. Um, and it said, um, the tagline for it was, um, was like Guru Nanak's greatest message. Mm. Um, and, and it was like Guru Nanak didn't believe in God. Yes, I, I remember you and that, that and that just totally. I was like, "What is going on here?" Because I, I was expecting like this lecture on like you know, don't cut your hair, wake up early, like all this sort of the sort of the very superficial um, 
I mean, they're not necessarily superficial things, but for the way in which it's usually like, these are the things that you should do, a very prescriptive approach to, to Sikhi. Mm. And and I watched that video and I was like, well, firstly, it was in it was in English. Mm. And I was like, uh, this is crazy. I've never heard anyone sort of talk about this stuff in English. Usually in my experience used to be the same as yours, which is the exegesis would be done in Punjabi at the Gurdwara. And yeah. if you kind of the kinds of language, the kind of language that I just wasn't able to yeah. understand as a child. Um, and that just got me really fascinated because I was like, because, because what he was saying was, is that like, you know, you know, he was saying like, you know, you look at the mountains, you look at the rivers and you say, wow, Vahe Guru, you, you created this. Mm. And he's saying like, but have you ever stopped to be like, actually, I see the divine in the mountains. I see you in the river. I see it. And actually the reason that struck a chord with me was because I'd started to sort of explore without even knowing that I was exploring my spirituality um, was through the outdoors, through hiking, through wild camping, being in the mountains. And I'd had these moments of like a, a profound joy and bliss and a sense of contentedness. And I sort of recognized that in what mm. Sapa was saying in, in that in that video. And so it prompted me to then go on this journey of like being like, well, okay, this sort of seems to challenge what I think the Sikh tradition is and is about and what, Maybe, maybe, maybe there is something of value here. Maybe I actually do identify with this more than I, mm. than I realized. And so I got into it and yeah, as I started to understand it better, um, I was like, oh, this is, this isn't talking about a, you know, as Satpa puts it, a Mr. God, a guy <laughs> in the sky, yeah. um, who, you know, you have to, you know, is either going to be pleased or displeased with what you do and that will determine an afterlife. It's just, it was more about the all pervasive, um, just sort of oneness of the universe, which sort of is being explored and reflected in like modern physics. And yeah. like, it, it's, it wasn't <laughs> like, and, and actually, and I draw the parallels in the book about like the parallels with like the Stoics. And I was like, well, why are the Stoics being talked about as philosophers? And whereas like this is being, you know, has been put in the religion box. Mm. And so again, this sort of bothness thing, I was like, well, what, maybe if I sort of ignore the distinctions of philosophy and religion and just engage with what's being written. And then it was, you know, reading the opening of like Deputy Sahib, which talks about how, you know, like bathing a thousand times will not cleanse you, like contorting yourself into like various yogic positions, you know, you will not find sort of like peace and stillness, mm. um, you know, where, you know, abstaining or sort of a total indulgence is not going to sort of bring you any sort of joy. And that actually to sort of w what he says about walk on the path of hookum, like the idea that there is a, a um a natural unfolding to the world which is what the stoics talk about They're the stoics say like um i think in one of seneca's letters says um um for fate the willing leads the unwilling drags along and i'd had this experience in the grand canyon of like i'd went on this expedition where we were rafting the grand canyon and like I really had to become one with the river yeah. in order to sort of survive this trip. And it was a terrifying experience because on the second day of the expedition, our raft flipped. I thought I was going to die. And I just realized that I really hadn't confronted my, how I felt about death. And I, when I, when I, when I got out of the water and we were like drying out all our stuff, I, I sort of, I had a copy, copy of Epictetus's discourses. And the first thing I saw after pulling it out to check that it wasn't totally destroyed by the water was the line, I must die, but must I die bawling? And so I was like, oh wow, this whole like trip's gonna be about me confronting my own mortality and like becoming at ease with death. And I knew that this was stuff that the the, the Sikhs and the Gurus had been talking about um, as well, of, you know, like um, to sort of, to die while alive. The death, and they're just talking about the death of the self, the death of the ego yeah. and and through that, I was like, well, this really resonates because um, that's what I, f I felt like I was re really the story of both not half is me trying to figure out how to live and how to be content. And, and so to bring it back to like the whole, the both not half journey is that I, I'd started having these thoughts and engaging with this thinking in uh, late 2018 and then and I'd come across the term non-duality and the idea that the self and the other was not was not distinct or separate. Um, 
And then in that January, I then articulate both not half. Yeah. And so I hadn't made the link at the time, but I'm I'm more than I'm pretty sure that that is where the idea must have come from in some way. Yeah. And actually, and that's sort of, you know, like I was saying, like the final chapter, the final chapter was called One Not Both. And um it was me really realizing that both not half was my own sort of personal articulation uh-huh. of ick of oneness. Yeah. Um, and realizing that, oh, that this is, and then digging into the history of, um, of Sikhi and actually realizing that there is a whole diverse history to what it means to be a Sikh. You know, the idea of the Khalsa Sikh is, is, you know, as established by um, Guru Gobind Singh is, um, is a, is a way of being a Sikh. It's not the only way of being a Sikh. You've got the whole wonderful diverse history of the Nanak Banthis of like followers of Nanak's teachings. And they, there are Nanak Banthis who would maybe identify both as Nanak Banthis and as Muslims yeah, or as yeah. like Hindu. And, um, you know, so much of Sikh scripture and writing cannot be understood without the context of like Islam and Hindu, Hinduism, the Hindu Dharam. Um, you know, there's like Sh- Shiva, Burma, uh, Brahma, like um, are all referenced in like Japji Sahib and stuff. So, yeah. So anyway, the more I was digging into it, I was like, oh, this, this whole sense of like a seek is a separate and distinct specific box, which I either have to be in or out of that sort of started to dissolve. And I was like, well, I can have my own relationship with this Mm. and in my own way feel, and that's why I feel quite comfortable now about asserting my Sikh identity because I feel like I found my own way to connect with it. And it's not necessarily, um, you, you know, that I don't look like a typical Sikh, but that's again, like, I mean, it's the idea of like, <laughs> you know, typicality, hierarchical, like what is more Sikh or less Sikh. It's yeah, like, yeah. I might not be a typical Sikh in appearance, but that doesn't make me any less yeah, yeah. of a Sikh. Yeah. yeah. Man, I, there's just so much I, I think I could talk to you about <laughs> on that subject. I really do hope you write another book that dives in into more of the sort of spiritual side of you. Cause I really enjoyed that last chapter, as you can tell from all Yeah, the, it's so lovely to see how many pages yeah. is like, yeah. Cause I feel like down. I'm sort of on my journey with that as well. So I think that really resonated with me, but I think mm. that the way you've written the book will, will provide uh, a, a real sort of guide to understanding a lot of mixedness and actually understanding what is mm. quite a complicated world where we draw where we sort of strive for simplicity and black and whites um yeah which i think is just a natural sort of human instinct um for for folks so i really really congratulate you on this and i uh, i'd love to read the yeah, some more on sort of the parallels between stoicism and sikhi and uh and and loads of of other sort of religious texts as well so yeah that's great. Yeah, I ho- hopefully, fingers crossed. And it's so lovely for you to, to say that, like the the sense of it as a being a guide, because I think I, I wrote it. I I tried writing a book which was essentially like here are the answers. Yeah, and I struggled. I I, I yeah. really I found that too difficult. Um, and I realized that that wasn't the book that I was meant to be writing. Nor was it a book that, you know, it's quite it's incredibly egotistical to feel that I could somehow present all the answers for sure. people. And realizing that all what all I could do really is chart my own journey. Um and it's a journey of transformation, it's a journey of discovery. Um and you know, I initially thought either the story had to either begin with the realization of both not half or end with the realization of both not half. And actually in the writing of it, I realized that oh right, that's both not half isn't isn't really an answer, it's a step along the way. It's and that's why it's sort of that bit is the, the middle of the book. It's like, and I've, it's like Aladdin finding the genie in the lamp. Is you know that's not how the story starts. It's not how the story ends. It's the bit in the middle. It's like yeah. the thing that changes everything. Yeah, yeah. And that's um, my hope is that anybody who reads this sort of goes with me on on my journey, and it perhaps inspires and offers a way for people to go on on their own journey of transformation. So to hear that that's in any way had that sort of an impact on you is, is deeply wonderful because that's yeah 
all I could have hoped for. <laughs> That's great, man. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate you. If you loved that episode, you will love the full library of podcasts from the Doctor's Kitchen Library. We talk about everything from inflammation, supplements, and food as medicine. Just like this episode right here. You can click it right now and check it out.